As you know, I'm a pain management specialist. Um, I, uh, it's taken a long time to put together this evening for you. Um, what we're going to do is we're not going to rush things. So um, I hope you've got a cup of tea with you. There's a lot to talk about and there's a lot that we want to get through. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, do our best to get through everything. Pelvic pain is a, is a massive uh, 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 thing that is not spoken about. So we spent quite a bit of time getting this all up and running. We've got myself, pain specialist, and I'll introduce myself in a second. We've got Susan Evans, um, founder of uh, Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia. Um, we've got Rajiv Chawla, uh, pain specialist, uh, significant experience in pelvic pain, and uh, Claudia Cheng, who is a, a gyne gynecologist and laparoscopic surgeon. So all of us deal with pelvic pain, and we have done so for many years. Only more recently have people started talking about it. So what I'll do is I'll talk for about 20, 25 minutes. I'll talk a little bit about chronic pain and then bring it into pelvic pain. Um, I'll hand over to uh, Susan to give a bit of introduction to the foundation. Uh, Rajiv will talk about 15 or 20 minutes, uh, as will Claudia, uh, Claudia on, on their areas of expertise. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. I don't work for any medical companies or uh, any, any pharmaceutical companies. So anything I say is purely based on experience. So the, the clinic that we have was started about 10 years ago and it was developed on one point and that's no one should suffer from pain. Uh, and that's our guiding light. That's, that defines what we do and how we do it. And that's all we do is, uh, is we manage pain. We have pain specialist physicians. Most of us are anaesthetists by training. We've got rehab specialists, addiction specialists, psychiatrists, um, and various allied health parts of the team. Uh, and again, just focus on one thing, and that's managing all kinds of pain. So this is the way we approach pain. And I'm going to talk about pain in general first. This is the way we approach pain. You might consider it as a stepwise approach. You try some simple things. If that's not helpful, you might step on to the next step of treatments, which gets a little more uh, intrusive or a little more medical. Um, and of course, you don't want to step high up, or you, if you need to, you step high up. But again, as you de define more um, uh, detailed treatments, that comes with it some risks. Uh, the key with any pain management is to get the patient better despite the pain and that's the rehab side of things so another way of looking at pain might be and this is the way we approach pain is we give a patient a pain diagnosis what's causing the pain if we know how it's affecting the person and then five steps or treatment uh, approaches and one or more may be appropriate uh, but these are just options and they might be lifestyle changes allied health approaches, medication management. Um, sometimes we do procedures, and of course there are more, um, more high-end treatments to manage pain. We have consulting rooms in Heidelberg, uh, mainly in Richmond, as well as in Donville, so we're around. We aim to see 85% of patients that are referred to us within the first 30 days of referral. This is an important slide. Um, when do you use a pain specialist? And the, the diagnoses highlighted in um, blue are that may be relevant to this discussion tonight. So chronic pain after surgery, yeah. uh, neuropathic pain, nerve mediated pain, mm -hmm. sometimes other forms of neuropathy or pain mm -hmm. problems. And of course, you've got pelvic pain and visceral pain, which we'll come to in a few minutes. Muscle pain can be associated with these conditions, as can some widespread pain conditions. Another reason for seeing a pain specialist might be if there's medication problems. If you're on too many opioids or opioids are not helping but causing troubles, other medications are not helping or causing side effects. So there are many reasons why somebody in the pelvic pain world might reach out to a, to a pain specialist or a pain specialist and their team. Now the cost of pain, if you have a look on the right side of your screen, diabetes costs the economy about $7 million a year. Chronic pain, costs well over $200 billion a year. Uh, and that's not only in the treatments or the effects of the, uh, the effects to the, to the economy, but it's also the, the softer effects 
So it's a very costly problem and it affects a lot of people. So chronic pain is a primary medical problem. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem in its own right, which means that it, it, it can sometimes develop without a reason. So chronic primary pain, which means there is no defined cause, as opposed to chronic secondary pain, which is triggered by a medical condition. One of the chronic primary pains is chronic visceral pain, which is pelvic pain. Not always, but sometimes. So what is primary pain? Well, that's pain where you've had for more than three months. It causes significant emotional distress, functional distress, and there's no reason for the pain that could be uh, uh, defined. So that is what chronic pain is, primary pain. And as you can see there, chronic primary visceral pain, there are many types. There could be epigastric pain, so abdominal pain, uh, irritable bowel is a primary pain condition, um, abdominal pain, bladder pain, and pelvic pain, which is what we're talking about tonight. Now, what is secondary pain? That is pain where there's been a trigger. So that's so secondary visceral pain is pain where number two, you can see there, there is either an inflammatory problem, a vascular blood vessel problem, or a pressure problem that is triggering the pain. But have a look at the, the point in red. The pain may persist beyond a successful treatment of underlying cause. So what that means is, is if you've got endometriosis and it's treated, the pain may persist. So that is secondary pain. Now, not always, but that's the, that's the um, implication. So that's pain from inflammation, vascular problems and mechanical problems that trigger this pain in your body. Pain can also be triggered by surgery. So surgery is there to treat problem, but sometimes the surgery itself can trigger hypersensitive part of the body and actually trigger the pain. We'll come to that in a little while. So here's a bit of um, information for you. There's two types of, two parts to the body. There's the covering of the body, which is called the somatic system. That's the muscles of um, the muscles and, and covering. And then you've got the inside of the body, which is termed the viscera. So that's all the, the organs, so the heart, lungs, intestines, digestive system, etc. So we're talking about pelvic pain now. So there are two types of pain, pain that is triggered on the outside of the body. So muscle pain, and that's a very specific kind of pain, isn't it? You can point a finger on that kind of pain. It's very focused, it's very local, and it's got a certain feeling about it that is somatic pain. So the covering of your body. Whereas visceral pain, we're talking about the organs, the, the pelvic organs, the intestines, that pain is a different kind of pain. The nerves are very different. They're very uh, rudimentary nerves. So you can't point a finger at where it hurts. It just hurts in a general area. Those uh, nerves are associated with a lot of emotional components. So you feel nauseated, you feel tired, you feel um, your, your pulse rate changes. So it's a very uh, um, rudimentary pain, if I could use that as a term. So there's a big difference between pelvic pain and other pain. Now, there are two types of visceral, there are many types of visceral pain. So viscera is organ pain. There might be pain from the organ itself, where the organ hurts. So the liver hurts, the, the ovaries hurt. Sometimes um, that pain may be referred to another part of the body. So you might be feeling pain in your pelvic region, but you're actually getting pain in your back or pain in your abdomen. So that's called a referred pain, and that's called a visceral referred pain. Uh, and of course, sometimes you get pain in one part of the body that is experienced in another part of the body. So the, so the, the complaint, it's hard to say, well, that's the complaint, therefore that is the pain. So for example, have a look at um, uh, diagram D. So you get pain in the lower abdomen, pain in the back. That might be a referred pain from the pelvic region. So you've got troubles in the pelvis, but you feel it in an area outside the pelvis. Uh, and that's why a team is required to, to, to diagnose and treat these conditions. And uh, so 15 or more percent of women have pelvic pain. Abdominal pain affects 25% of the population. Dysmenorrhea, pain on menstruation, affects up to 50% of um, uh, females at a point. 
bowel problems, so irritable bowel, 10 to 20%. And of course, right at the bottom, male pelvic pain occurs in nine or 10%, which is something that is really not discussed amongst males. It's just one of those tab wow. taboo topics. Um, so it's a common problem, it's a, it's a common problem. Um, what am I gonna diagnose? Well, I've got to ask myself, and again, working with a gynecologist, is this a gastrointestinal problem that's triggering the pelvic pain? Is this a urological problem? Is it a gynecological problem? Or is it a problem from the spine? Is it a problem from nerves itself? So to diagnose pelvic pain, uh, pelvic pain really takes a team approach. I'm not gonna to spend too much time on that slide, um, but effectively, I'll come back to that. So pelvic pain might show itself in little areas, little spots of pain on the body, as you can see from real diagrams. Or it might be associated with very widespread pain conditions. So no one pain is the same. So you can see the bottom left, you've got pain in the abdomen, pain in the pelvis, pain down the legs, um, and pain even up into the shoulders. So it's really hard for us to tease this out. Um, sometimes opioids are involved. Uh, you can see on the bottom uh, left, anxiety, insomnia, IBS, bowel problems. Bottom right, have had a laparoscopy, I've had a, hyster a hysteroscopy, I've had a, a cystoscopy and, and many other treatments. So the aim is to have a diagnosis and then a plan. So is it persistent pelvic pain? Well, what are the causes? It might be endometriosis. This is an example of a patient's diagnosis. There's endometriosis. I'm not sure if it's active. I need to talk to the gynecologist. There is definitely neuropathic pain because it comes out into the uh, back. And there's definitely muscle pain in the abdominal wall as well. And of course, there are functional limitations and how it affects a person. And that's what a treatment plan might look like. There's a lifestyle component. There are an allied health component. There are medication uh, aspects that we may, may address. Sometimes an intervention or a more advanced therapy uh, could, be, could be utilized as well. Um, I'm not gonna spend time on that. So medications, we're, we're anesthetists, we're pain specialists, we're good at managing and simplifying medications and sometimes less is more. A lot of you might be familiar with some of the medications on your screen, but if you're dealing with somebody with pelvic pain, then you need to consider symptoms. So you might use duloxetine if somebody's got um, stress incontinence. You might use Im imipramine when somebody's got neurological problems. Um, you might use a certain medication, metazapine, if depression is a problem. You might not use opioids if constipation is a problem. So it's the experience with these medications where you can use a certain medication depending on the symptoms that are in front of you. So, what? Um, so we've got abdominal wall. A lot of this pain might be coming from the abdominal wall. And you can see there are nerves in the abdomen, in the wall between the muscles that might be triggering some pain. And you can see here the various genitofemoral nerves start in the lower abdomen, but refer down into the pelvis. We know the nerve supply to the various parts of the pelvis. And if there's pain very low down in the pelvis, it might be coming from the sacral nerves, the pelvic nerves. If the pain is higher up, it might be coming from the thoracic nerves, the, the higher spinal nerves. Um, and again, this is, I'm just giving you a flavor of how we think when we address these problems. There is the sympathetic nervous system that can sometimes uh, relay some of these pain signals that we might choose to focus on. And there's a picture of the pudendal nerve, which most people have heard of or know, and that's the key nerve to the pelvis, uh, which I'll come to in a few minutes. The coccygeal nerves, these are the, so you can see the little tip down at the bottom, that's the coccyx, and that's the back of the spine. And these coccygeal nerves sometimes can trigger what we call coccydinia, which is pain in the coccyx region. Yeah. Um, so let's have a look at a couple of treatment approaches. If you've got somebody with abdominal wall pain, you say, well, how do you diagnose it? One of the key things is to actually examine the abdomen. You get somebody to tense the abdominal wall by lifting their legs or the head off the, off the table, examination table. And if the pain gets worse, then you ask yourself, is some of this pain coming from the abdominal wall? Is this abdominal wall pain or is this part of the pain? Um, 
You might focus on deep breathing and various forms of muscle relaxation. Use the physio for that respect. You might focus on some simple muscle relaxants that can help. You might focus those. Um, you might focus on those nerves that you think might be triggering some of the abdominal wall pain. Uh, do a nerve block or, or, or try and free up one or two of the little nerves. We sometimes do what we call pulsed radio frequency to a nerve. So if a nerve is very hypersensitive, instead of injecting a chemical like anesthetic on the nerve, you can, um, you can uh, put some heat on the nerve and that can sometimes stun the nerve into, into being quiet. It might last for six months, it might last for a year or two, but there are risks with a treatment. Sometimes your pain can go up before it comes down. So again, there is no one size treatment fits all. What about an approach to visceral pain? So, um, so you've got this pelvic deep nerve pain that doesn't respond to treatments. We might use the allied health approach. So diet, pelvic physiotherapy, psychological therapies. We might use nerve medications. And a similar thing, we can focus nerve blocks or pulsed radio frequency treatments on various nerves that we think may be of relevance in this pain syndrome. Uh, pudendal neuralgia. Um, everyone knows that a lot of people talk about it, but it's actually not a very common cause of pelvic pain. Um, the pudendal nerve gives you sensation in the lower part of the, the, the pelvis and perineal area, that area outlined in blue. Um, and this is a pain on sitting. This is a pain that doesn't really wake people up at night. This pain is relieved by a pudendal nerve block. And there are some other characteristics you can use to diagnose pudendal neuralgia. And again, different pain, different treatment approach. We sometimes use topical creams with ketamine and other things to try and desensitize the skin. And we might focus treatments on the pudendal nerve, always remembering to focus treatment on the person with pain. Uh, we as pain specialists don't have a lot of science to guide us in some respects. So we have to use what's out there. We have to use experience and we have to use therapies and um, expertise as a group. This is a study looking at um, pudendal neuralgia uh, being treated with a pulsed radio frequency. Um, the, the research is not very good. It's just one location, one center with a, with a series of patients. So it's not very good research, but it's Sometimes all we've got to go by. So we have to be careful, cautious, and of course, talk to patients about what research we use to guide our therapies. But this was a, a series of 20 people with, with pudendal neuralgia, and they just uh, focused on uh, um, uh, patient global impression of change, a very soft focus or uh, outcome measure. And a lot of patients, um, up to 80 or 90% of patients had better uh, pain control over time. And I think they, they follow these patients up for four years. So again, experience, thoughtful use of um, evidence to guide therapies and working within a team. Coccidinia, same thing, define the pain, define the person in pain, what are the effects, focus on that. Sometimes medications, sometimes targeting a nerve or a series of nerves and sometimes we use what we call neuromodulation uh, and more advanced pain therapies. Um, I want to just pivot for, I've got a few more minutes, so um, chronic post-surgical pain, this is something I want to talk to you about. Uh, this, this, this means pain that has been uh, triggered by surgery. Uh, um, it's very common. It's more common than we think. It's not to say the surgery shouldn't happen or the surgery has been done incorrectly, but sometimes surgery itself can trigger a pain. Yeah. We certainly know that it's underestimated. Depending on the science and research you look at, anything from 5 to 85% of surgeries can trigger pain, which I'll elaborate on in a second. But more importantly, anything from 2 to 15% of those have severe debilitating pain. The number is roughly about one in one in five uh, surgeries can trigger uh, pain that affects the patient. So we know that it's common. We know that it's unrecognized. We know that it's underdiagnosed and poorly treated. Now, the reason why I put this in there is because a lot of people with pelvic pain have a procedure. And I look forward to hearing uh, Claudia's views and experience on this. But sometimes um, uh, the 
the what what is being focused on does not actually help the pain. So you might treat something, but it may not help the pain, or it might trigger another kind of inflammatory pain. But on the whole, this is not talking about pelvic pain. This is all surgery. Uh, it can trigger pain. So let's look at a couple of numbers. Um, amputation. So part of the body is amputated. Now that causes up to 85% of patients get pain, which makes sense because you're cutting a nerve and sometimes even pulling a nerve if it's a traumatic amputation. So we, we get that. Um, cesarean section, a group of patients can get pain on the scar or pain triggered by a cesarean section. Dental surgery, up to 10% of people can have pain. That's a root canal, a tooth, tooth being removed. That's a high number considering how many dental procedures we're having. And the various other more invasive treatments like uh, surgeries in the chest, you know, they really trigger nerve pain and can cause nerve pain. So I had a look at the numbers for hysterectomy. Again, not a lot out there, not a lot of good research. So case series, um, uh, single locations, sometimes um, uh, wider locations. But one of the studies done in 2018 shows that pelvic uh, chronic pain after hysterectomy can occur in anything from 10 to 50% of women. And a large group of that pain might be neuropathic in nature, so nerve-mediated pain. And the study down below from 2012 uh, said that maybe 17 to 30 percent of hysterectomy patients could have some ongoing pain. So again, the numbers are high, and again, this doesn't mean the surgery shouldn't be done. It just means that sometimes surgery can trigger pain. Um, who is at risk of developing chronic pain after surgery? Across the board, any kind of surgery. The four Ps. If you have moderate to severe pain before the surgery, your nervous system is primed to continue with pain. If you have what we call psychological vulnerabilities, so you've got anxiety, depression, you're at risk of developing pain. If you've got acute pain, so severe post-operative pain immediately after the surgery, that is a risk factor. And again, some surgeons reach out to us as pain specialists to help in those situations. And if you've got severe pain or moderate to severe pain when you're discharged from hospital, that puts you at risk of developing post-surgical pain. Not always, it's a risk factor, as we say. There are many other risk factors, but I just wanted to get some information across to you. So I've talked for just over 25 minutes because everyone else needs to talk. Um, so the summary points are chronic pain is a massive problem. Uh, pelvic pain is a huge problem itself and it's not openly discussed. So ho hopefully this can start some dialogue. Chronic pelvic pain is a complicated medical condition. It's not a single thing, it's many things. And that's why it requires a team approach. Um, and as a pain specialist, I'll put my hand up and say, pain specialists should be involved in pelvic pain at some point along the journey, particularly if people are not improving. Um, so I've pretty much uh, had my say. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, what I'm going to do now is hand over to Susan. So we're going to go from two extremes managing pelvic pain. The simple approaches, the self-management approaches, using a great foundation like the Pelvic Pain Foundation. And then Rajiv will kind of pivot on to the more complex uh, treatment approaches as well, um, followed by Claudia. So I'll be quiet and, um, and hand over to Susan. Thank you very much. Uh, such a pleasure to be here and to meet you all today. Uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to speak to you all. So just a few um, words about where the Pelvic Pain Foundation fits in. So several years ago, back in 2010, there was a big conference around Australia of everyone involved in pain in Canberra, where they were going to have a, a full strategy. And I went along to that. And it was really obvious when you listened to the great speakers and everybody very keen that pelvic pain hadn't actually been much included. So a few years later, some of us decided that it was time for a change, time for new things. So we founded the Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia, and we're there to help advocate research and education for any Australian with pelvic pain, be that girls, uh, women or men. So since then, we've 
provided a website which has a lot of information, which I hope that many of you might have actually had a look at. And over that time, we've actually, one of our big projects has been in making a difference to the next generation of people with pain, starting with students in schools and getting them on the right path. So this is why I've titled this presentation, A Girl's Life because this is one of our major focuses at the moment. We haven't forgotten everybody else, but this is one of our major focuses. So just to talk about, and for many of you, this may be so familiar. For health practitioners, if you look in your waiting room at your patients, you're gonna find that the majority of your patients with chronic pain are women. They're not all, but more women have pain conditions than men. And it starts early. So if you look at this graph where I've been dreadfully conventional and use the sort of the pinky red for girls and the blue for boys, when they're young, there's not much difference between, uh, in these ages down here, there's not much difference. Not many of them have a chronic pain condition. But once those girls start going through puberty, they get more chronic pain conditions. So by the time they're 16 to 18 years old, no fault of their own, they're about nearly four times as likely as the boys to have a chronic pain condition. And the girls had more pain symptoms, more complex pain, more pain on most days. And you think, well, don't they grow out of it, you know, when they get older? But often not, no, you don't. So if you actually have a student who started off with bad periods during her teen years, and many of you I know that may have been one of your first pain symptoms, We've got this study that I did in Adelaide a couple of years ago, looking at 168 women who had period pain as one of their significant, um, sorry, we've jumped ahead a bit, as one of their symptoms. But look at all the other things they've got as well. They've got that stabbing pain, which is often on the sides of the pelvis and is so typical with pain from a muscle called obturator internus. They've got bowel problems, food intolerances, bladder problems, headaches, sometimes painful sex, maybe vulval pain. And then there's all the pain sensitization symptoms like fatigue or poor sleep, nausea, dizziness, sweaty, anxiety, and low mood. So it's much bigger than they just started with you know, they just have period pain. So what happened is that a few years ago, uh, the as a bipartisan political plan, Nicole Flint and Gay Broatman, so Nicole's from the Liberal Party, Gay's from the Labor Party, got together to develop the Parliamentary Friends of Endometriosis. Now, endometriosis is not the only cause of pelvic pain, but it's undoubtedly associated with pain in many uh, women. So this started Australia's National Action Plan for Endometriosis. And here you have us at the launch of that in Canberra. With, and it was very much a grassroots uh, plan. So all the consumers were polled as to what were their priorities, not what were other people's priorities, what were their priorities for making a big change in this area of healthcare. And out of that came the pep talk schools program, which we manage through the Pelvic Pain Foundation. So PEP Talk is the Periods, Pain and Endometriosis Schools Program. And it's funded as a combination of the federal government and state governments. This is our third year in South Australia. It's our second year in Western Australia. And in earlier this year, we've been funded to go to every state in Australia to do about 40% at the moment on our current funding of schools to start these young people on a better life with a better life trajectory. So at the moment, any state that signs on to pay half the money for the program will have our pain program through their state schools. And you know, we probably already are, but we're imminently going to be the biggest pain education for young people in Australia. So this is a group of students from a regional uh, school that we went to. And in the middle is our fabulous, one of our fabulous educators, Michelle, and they're all loving their uterus. And I suspect that for many women, they haven't loved their uterus for quite a long time. So that's our pep talk program. And we go everywhere in those states, regional, uh, metropolitan, public schools, private schools, and our aim is to start every student on a better life throughout Australia. So we're working towards every school in Australia. That's another one of our educators, uh, Taylor Gartner. This is in Western Australia. And 
we we've got a, we can adjust to just about any school's needs. So we have uh, modifications for our program for special needs, indigenous groups, culturally diverse, gender diverse students. And we've started working more with sporting clubs as well because so many students drop out too young because they've got pain and they just gradually drop out of school, drop out of sport. We're looking for a much healthy generation coming forward. And we have a program for boys. And you might think, well, they probably don't have much pelvic pain, but our program helps them discuss these tricky topics it also uh, helps them to learn about pain so they'll be better able to make good decisions and discuss with their health practitioners when they have pain themselves. But also we teach them how to better support the women in their lives because their lives are going to be affected by women with pain. How to talk about things, how to support them and how to be able to, to bring up and, and manage those tricky things for the women in their lives. And the boys we find are often really interested. It's targeted at year 10 and they're quite interested in girls, but they realise they don't know very much. So actually it's really well received. Now, the um, so what did we find? Well, I've got a little bit of information here that we've got from our data. And remember, this is real time Australian, South Australian data. And what we find is that our students have a lot of pain. The first thing before the program, we ask them how many days a month do they have pain of some kind in their pelvis? And what you can see on the graph on the side is how many days they've told us they've got pain for. And of course, this is how much percentage of the students say they've got that number of uh, days of pain. And so what we might normally have considered to be normal period pain is maybe day one to two of a period. And that's not necessarily abnormal. But what you can see from our pie chart is that those with no pain with periods or maybe one to two days with periods, they're the pink ones here. But that is not the majority of students in our schools right now. So then we've got these other ones with more days a month of pain. And I suggest to you that we don't know, but many of these will grow and develop into about the one in nine or 10 Australian women who will develop endometriosis. Not necessarily all of these students, but this is the group significantly at risk. I suggest that some of these are in this purple thing. These are the ones that are going to have a higher chance of developing endometriosis now. But when we talk about chronic pain, the ones that are super interesting are these ones with more pain already. So they're young people and they've got pain on most days per month. And I, what we believe is that these are the patients that will be coming to a pain clinic in the future, maybe in five years time, maybe in 20 years time. But this is a group at risk that deserve fabulous attention, care and support in the simple things often that starts thing to avoid those problems in their future. I, these are pain clinic patients waiting to happen. So you can visit us online. You can follow us on Instagram and see all the things that we're doing at our Pep Talk and Pelvic Pain Foundation Instagrams. And I would really encourage you to look at the Pelvic Pain Foundation and see what we have to offer. We don't, um, we're not a, we're not a um, uh, consumer support organization. There are other ones that do that, but we consider our role to be educating the public and health practitioners and po politicians and the people that make policy so that this area gets far more attention. I think you'll find if you've got pelvic pain that there will be something for everybody on our website. We particularly focus on the simple side of things, on the things that you can do yourself the things you can do with your general practitioner and the things that you can do cost effectively to make a difference in your life, to have less problems with pain. And we also uh, help educate health practitioners so that everybody can upskill and do a better job themselves as well. As Nick so beautifully put, pain is such a big thing and we don't have a great number of workforce of people who are beautifully trained in this area. So everyone from a health practitioner perspective is going to need to step up a bit and learn outside their area and learn how to help their patients. And all the patients are going to need to step up 
and learn a bit more so they can help themselves as well and work together with their health practitioner. So how you can help us. Victoria, I'm sorry to say, has yet to sign on to their 50% of the bargain for your young people. We're still working with them and we're very hopeful, but at the moment we're limited to a limited number of schools in your state until your state government signs on that they want to uh, support it as well. So if you have anyone in your back pocket who you listen to or you write to, tell them that pep talk is what Victorians need. And we'd like to help you if you're a health practitioner. We have a health practitioner um, pep focus seminar in May that will help GPs and things to know what to do when a student comes to them from pep talk. We have a subscriber program to support health practitioners. We have pep talk next steps for those students who work out they've got a problem and want to come along and hear um, how I will talk to them about their more complex pain. And we have an online shop for all those tricky products people can't have. So do remember us, we're here to help both sides of the consultation desk. And that's enough for me. But once again, thank you, Nick. Thank you, Ramsey Healthcare. Thank you, Pain Specialists, for inviting me here to contribute to your fabulous evening. Thanks, Susan. That, that was fantastic. And I hope you can stay online because I'm yes. sure there'll be some questions for you. Certainly. Certainly. Um, so we've got one extreme, which is uh, uh, preventing, picking it up early, uh, and 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 not letting pain get the better of people, all the way to the other extreme, which is managing severe, um, what we call tertiary pain. So in a in a tertiary centre, which is a very specialised centre, um, and Rajiv, yeah, I'm 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 very proud to call him a friend and a colleague. Um, he developed a pelvic pain clinic in uh, the UK. Uh, because he felt there was a need for it and that was 10 11 years ago so he's got an incredible amount of experience with a very very small uh, uh, group of um, people with severe pelvic pain so I'll, I'll hand you over to Rajiv and he might introduce himself a bit more and give us his thoughts and experiences so thanks very much Rajiv. Thank you Nick uh, I'm just gonna uh, share my screen uh, Sorry, it's just playing up a tiny bit. Here we go. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Ramsey. Uh, thank you, uh, Nick, uh, for inviting me to speak on this uh, evening. I, I really feel privileged. And I want to say thank you, first of all, uh, to the, all the participants. If you were not there, then this evening is uh, uh, perhaps not a successful evening. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I have uh, been in this field for a while, so I wouldn't call myself a dinosaur, but uh, I will just give a small introduction. I graduated from uh, medical school about 25 years ago and started uh, getting interested in this from 2000 onwards while I was doing anesthetics. And for first eight years from 2000 to 2008, as part of my anesthetics, uh, I uh, learned about pain medicine and then I threw myself completely into it from 2008 onwards. And for past seven years, I have just been practicing 100% chronic pain. I was lucky to be given an opportunity while I was working as a consultant in Liverpool, UK at the Walton Center uh, to develop uh, a pelvic pain clinic, which we had uh, very successfully done as an MDT clinic with a psychologist, gynecologist, and we were looking after about 3 million people uh, in the region. Uh, so uh, th that's, that's, that's uh, uh, my uh, background. So I will come to the, uh, this evening's talk. Uh, this evening talk, this uh, evening's talk is mainly around advanced pain therapies uh, for pelvic pain. And one of the therapies which can be used is neuromodulation. So again, uh, disclosures, uh, I am not on panel of any of the medtech companies or being paid by anyone. So there are nothing to disclose. Uh, so what would I uh, be uh, discussing this evening is, is there a need for advanced therapies? What is neuromodulation? What's the history behind it? What are the kinds of neuromodulation which we use in uh, pelvic pain? 
And I would just give you a flavor by discussing a case which I was involved in approximately three years ago. So as Nick said, uh, all patients uh, deserve an individualized pain uh, therapy plan, which may involve painkillers. It involves specialist pain psychology, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, antineuropathic pain medications, complementary therapy like acupuncture or other therapies actually leading or empowering you to self-manage the pain. There is a role for pain injections, which uh, in a pain clinic, a pain specialist will be happy to offer you. And definitely uh, a treatment with hormones or surgeries is possible, but that will be discussed in specialist clinics. And today evening, Dr. Cheng will be talking to you about surgical approaches. However, when we look closely, how many patients benefit with pharmacology, you won't be surprised to, to see that two out of three patients either stop the medication due to side effects or do not get much benefit out of the medication. So there is some need there to improvise. If we look at this diagram, and if we think of how the pain is uh, transducted from the area where it started, this can be female uh, pelvic organs or can be male pelvic organs. This could start after a disease, operation, or anything similar. Then the pain signal goes through the nerves, to the spinal cord, and goes to the brain. However, with time, we understand three to six months, this pain is amplified by the nervous system. And the nervous system amplification is not only happening where the pain started in the periphery, but it also happens in the spinal cord and the brain. Hence, when we do injections, we do not get complete pain relief in all patients. So we then rely on uh, nerve stimulation, neuromodulation. Now, what is neuromodulation? This is using electricity to change how the nervous system behaves, and hence we can achieve pain relief for refractory pains. This is application of current. And about 50 years ago, this principle was explained as gate control theory, where we pass pleasant electrical current to the nerves. So the nerves shut the gate to the uh, pain signal, which is troubling the patient. The history goes back long ago, about two and a half thousand years ago when in Roman times, if somebody had gout, the physician would say, go to the sea and put your foot on the black torpedo fish. As some of you who have touched a black torpedo, their body cells, what we call myocytes, are electromyocytes and they generate. And if somebody was to put their foot on the black torpedo, they'll get an electric shock. And that was the first invention of neuromodulation. This was used in human body in 1967 by a neurosurgeon in the United States, who is still alive actually and doing this procedure. And it got an FDA approval in 1989. And since then it has been used for chronic pain, which is refractory to treatments. If you look at this diagram, you, you will see that we can use uh, neuromod neuromodulation at multiple levels, where the pain started in the pelvis, where the nerve is transducting this pain in the spinal cord or in the cerebral cortex or in the brain. When we put electrodes around the spinal cord and pass electricity, this is called spinal cord stimulation. Okay, so, in simple words, a spinal cord stimulation is minimally invasive. Yes, it is invasive. We need a small cut in the back. It's reversible. It can be taken out if there is a need to do any further procedures. It's quite high tech. There is a small pacemaker put in along with the wires, and there are multiple programs that can be run to give you pain relief. It's a long-term therapy. Once the magic box or the battery pack goes in, it can stay there for 10 odd years or so. And more, we have had patients who have had it for 15 odd years. Otherwise it can be changed. It is useful as part of a rehabilitation strategy because it is 
uh, used to give you pain relief and not all stimulators will completely switch the pain off. So a re it's part of a rehabilitation process through which the patient goes and it has to be given to carefully selected patients. It is unfortunately not effective for all types of pain and for every patient. Have a look here. This is how the electrical leads are put into epidural space. You can see some black dots here. These are the electrodes. And these are two electrical leads implanted into the spine. And you can see a battery pack, which is around the buttock muscle. And these are the two small incisions. They are approximately two and a half inches each around the middle of the spine and on top of the buttock. Okay, if you need more information about this, you could go to our website and download an ebook, which is free of cost for anyone who wishes to read about this therapy. Now, talking about the other kind of uh, nerve stimulation, it is called sacral nerve stimulation. Sacral nerve stimulation is when we apply current to the nerves coming out through the small of the back, through the sacrum, and especially to the nerves which are number S3 and S4, the uh, uh, sacral root number three and four. And if we apply current to these, then patients can uh, achieve analgesia. Now, we learned it as a, 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 pars a part and parcel of a therapy which was invented for bladder and bowel problems. Here you can see a battery pack around the button muscle and a wire going to the uh, sacral nerve and the nerves going to the bladder. So initially this therapy was invented as a bladder and bowel therapy, but later we understood that this can give pain uh, relief, especially for deep pelvic pain conditions. Here, this is how a battery pack and the wire looks in the pelvis. I was lucky to be involved in a uh, research where we looked at 14 patients, male and female both, pain of any origin, including urinary tract infections, surgeries, trauma. And we looked at uh, patients who had quite severe pain. Worst pain was about 8.9 out of 10. And when we implanted with the sacral nerve stimulator, we saw uh, the follow-up between five to 60 months that the pain had dropped by about 40%. But the other things which were helpful were that they were getting benefit with their bladder and bowel issues as well. So this can help pain and can help bladder and bowel issues. Now, after giving you a flavor of what neuromodulation is, what spinal cord stimulation and sacral nerve stimulation is, I would discuss a case which I was involved approximately three years ago. This was a lady who uh, uh, was 42 years old, uh, was suffering with abdominal or pelvic pain for six years. So you can imagine a young la lady suffering for pain uh, from age 36, came to the pain clinic at about age 42, generally fit and well, slim lady, no other medical problems. And she had tried most pain medications and now had requested to go to a specialist uh, pelvic pain clinic and hence was referred to our clinic. Whenever we get patients, we uh, ask for all the uh, previous documents so that we can see what investigations have been done, what treatments, including surgeries, hormonal treatment have been used, and what kind of pain treatments and pain medications have been used. Now, this helps us to actually uh, look at all aspects and develop a good diagnostic uh, plan so that we can give a good explanation that why the patient has pain and what can be done about it. So the similar thing was done for this lady. And as Nick had already shown a similar slide, at that minute, we are thinking about all causes. It could be coming from the uh, uh, organs of reproduction, from urinary organ, from the gut, or it could be musculoskeletal or neurological. Unfortunately, this lady had multiple operations for past uh, three to four years between 2012 to 2015, leading to clearance of all reproductive organs, uterus, tubes, ovaries due to endometriosis. And she was unfortunate to get some side effects from the big surgeries, had hematomas and had nerve injuries following this. She had further been in the pain clinic where 
again, some injections were offered, but she was uh, never uh, rendered pain-free state. So she came with her uh, husband to a clinic and she was seen in a, a pain clinic taken through a long session, 40 minutes odd for history and examination, again, trying to tease out which organ is giving her the pain. And near about all patients will go through a physical examination. And the idea is to identify where is the pain coming from. I, I think this is essential, but it can be quite stressful and painful when we go and touch the area which is giving pain, but it confirms us how to actually reach to the diagnosis. The examination is not only of the pelvis, but it is of pretty much whole body because we know that spine can send pain to the pelvis, to the groin. Hence, we do a complete examination. And pelvic or perineal examination, if the pain is located on that area. Our patient had a constant deep, dull pain, which was deep in the pelvic, had suprapubic pain, which is around the bikini line, and she scored it to be eight to nine out of 10. The examination showed sensory changes in the skin and she had some muscle tenderness. She went through some psychological screening, which was absolutely normal. Now comes the time and she's looking at us, what is our treatment plan? And in all these cases, the most important thing we figured out was explaining what was the diagnosis. And in this case, she was suffering with chronic pelvic pain, which was secondary to endometriosis. And she had post-surgical neuropathic pain. You may remember Dr. Castellis had alluded this, to this pain. And this is a diagnosis along with a deep pelvic pain secondary to endometriosis. She had been through all pain medications and didn't want to try them again. We took her through a very strong chili pepper patch to be applied to the pelvis, which was not helpful. And she had already tried injection. So we were kind of stuck. Where do we go from here? And these are the kind of cases where we can consider neuromodulation approach. She was taken through some external neuromodulation where we applied some electricity to the skin, but it was not helpful. And we came back to the drawing board and we discussed whether we use sacral nerve stimulation or spinal cord stimulation. Now, as a few of my medical colleagues would see, the pain is quite widespread. And I had uh, made a point that sacral of stimulation is perhaps useful for focal or deep pain, but not such widespread pain. Hence, it was discussed with this lady that we could use high frequency at 10,000 hertz, a spinal cord stimulation system to help with the pain. There was growing evidence at that time and there were case series with three cases and later with 15 cases, which showed really good benefit with this therapy. Hence, this was offered to this lady and she agreed to it. You can see here, uh, we did uh, an MRI scan, which was good. And we put one lead into the epidural space for a trial and her pain in the trial dropped from nine out of 10 to three out of 10. The trial went for about 10 days and she was about 75% better. And her pain medication also reduced by 50%. After the trial, this lead was removed and she was sent home to decide whether she wants to go on the route of permanent implant or not. I'm sure you have guessed it right. If the pain has dropped down by 75%, she chose to go ahead with the implant and she received an implant with two leads in the spine with a battery pack around the buttock. And the last I saw her was approximately two and a half years after the implant, and she was at least 80% pain-free. The good thing which was uh, evident was she was not taking any painkillers and she was back to full-time work. She had some discomfort around where the battery pack sits, but she was managing it without anything. So I would like to come back to the uh, talk of managing pelvic pain. The pelvic pain can start because of any injury, trauma, infection in the pelvis, but the mechanisms lie in the central nervous system. We have to treat each and every part, what comes with it, the functional, the behavioral, the psychological, the physiological, uh, uh, the physical disability which comes with it, 
to improve the quality of life. We have to treat individual phenomena to make patients better. And our experience is in keeping with the literature. If the pain is widespread, then one single therapy may not be useful. And we have to use a holistic approach, a multimodal approach to help the patients. So coming back to how we treat the pain, we use all these therapies together, a multimodal therapy to improve the quality of life. However, some patients may need uh, advanced therapies like neuromodulation, and these need to be uh, very carefully selected so that we do not put you through unnecessary operations. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks very much, Rajiv. That was uh, super. Um, we're getting quite a few questions. Um, I'm hopefully we'll get to some of them tonight. And if not, we'll definitely email everyone the answers. So now we're going to pivot again and we're going to move on to uh, surgical um, uh, approaches or more importantly, when not to operate. Um, so Claudia Cheng has got a vast amount of experience uh, in this field. I'll let, you, I'll let Claudia introduce herself, but what I've asked Claudia to do is to give another perspective in, in treating uh, uh, certain forms of pelvic pain from a, from a surgeon's view. So I'll hand over to you, Claudia. And again, thanks for your patience and thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. So I'll share my screen. Can we all see that? Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Thank you so you. much for inviting me to talk. Um, tonight I'm very happy to talk about operation. Uh, I am a laparoscopic surgeon and gynecologist, but I also have a very special interest in dealing with the pelvic pain, and it's not all about surgery. Um, first, and this is mostly about endometriosis surgery. There. So what is endometriosis first? We'll just briefly go through that. Um, endometriosis is when the endometrial cells within the uterus has, for some reason, deposited outside the uterus around the pelvis. And these deposits can latch onto the pelvic lining, causes inflammation, reacts to the cycles, and cause pain. A variant of endometriosis which is less talked about is adenomyosis. That's when the lining of the uterus infiltrates into the muscle wall of the uterus, making the whole uterus bigger, softer, bulkier, and typically can give you period pain and heavy period. And it they can go hand in hand. A lot of women or people have endometriosis and adenomyosis together. And more and more, we have divided endometriosis into two types, superficial versus deep. So superficial meaning just on the surface. So these deposits can be very fine, small, hard to see, and they don't go deep. They just on the surface, line on the lining of the um, deep is when it does go deep and invade deeper below it can form hard nodules um, sometimes can be picked up by a good ultrasound and it can make things stick together it can invade into nearby organs and so it forms the more severe you may also heard of the different stages of endometriosis stage one two three four Stage one and two are the milder superficial disease and stage three and four are the moderate severe disease. Hope you're all okay to look at pictures. Um, this is a normal pelvis with normal uterus, normal ovaries and fallopian tubes. And these are the different stages of endometriosis. The top two are the mild superficial form. You can hardly see the lesions there. You need to really zoom in with the camera to actually see that. And this one, you can see maybe a little few spots here and there, but it's just on the surface. It doesn't go deep. And even when superficial endometriosis are widespread, it can be everywhere, left, right, center, front, back. It is still staged as one or two. When we talk about three to four, these are the severe diseases. You can see plaques of endometriosis there. You've got a cyst in the ovary, which is called endometrioma and it contains old blood, so often we call it chocolate cyst. And stage four is the, the most severe. This one shows cysts on both ovaries. They are stuck together, stuck to the uterus, 
And when you unstick the ovaries underneath, you can see the rectum there stuck to the uterus. And in between that, you can have endometriotic nodules that can actually invade into the bowel wall of the, um, of the bowel. This is just an extreme example of adenomyosis. Uterus is really big. So you can see endometriosis is really a condition of female reproductive organs and mostly within the reproductive age. Um, endometriosis in males is extremely rare. So one of the problems amongst many with endometriosis is the presentation. They can present with pain or infertility or both, or they can be completely asymptomatic. 40% of women with endometriosis are asymptomatic. And another big problem is there is no correlation between the severity of disease and the severity of symptoms. You can have mild endometriosis and a lot of pain or a lot of endometriosis and absolutely no pain. So how do we figure out whether someone has endometriosis and if they do, is it the endometriosis causing the pain? Another issue with endometriosis is the diagnosis. Ultimately, the only real way to conclusively diagnose endometriosis is through surgery, which is laparoscopy or keyhole surgery. Nowadays, with good ultrasound and MRI, we can pick up the more severe form of endometriosis. Um, most endometriosis cysts, the endometriomas, can easily be picked up with, through scans. And if you go to a specialist ultrasound doctor to specifically look for endometriosis, um, those scans may be able to pick up the deep form of endometriosis and to see whether the bowel is stuck to the uterus. But even if you have a good ultrasound and it's normal, it still doesn't exclude the superficial form of endometriosis. And that is one of the common thing um, people are told, oh, you've got a normal ultrasound, you don't have that um, is not true. So how do we manage it? We can do nothing if they're asymptomatic or the symptoms are mild. You can use simple you know, painkillers or you can use hormonal treatment. And hormonal treatment is another talk altogether. Tonight, we are concentrating on more surgery. Um, and with surgery, we can remove the endometriosis um, either by cutting it out or destroying it. And if it's involving the bowel, then we may need to consider bowel surgery and when do we do that? Um, and then ultimately, hysterectomy with or without removing ovaries. So we sometimes call that So we'll talk about laparoscopy. Now we do require laparoscopy to diagnose endometriosis. Um, and another issue with endometriosis and pain is the delay in the diagnosis. So many times you hear, people in pain, young girls, women in pain, and seven, eight years down the track, and then they got the diagnosis. So I don't think there's real age cutoff for when to do a laparoscopy. If you have pain that is cyclical, cycle related, we think it's endometriosis, we try to manage it conservatively with hormones and with no improvement, then the next step is to do a laparoscopy to see whether you have endometriosis or not. But more importantly, is to see whether the pain improves after the surgery. Simply diagnosing endometriosis doesn't necessarily mean that is the cause of it. To me, if you treat the endometriosis and you get good pain relief for at least a year, then more likely it is the endo. And don't forget, if you do have an element of adenomyosis, and often it's quite impossible to, con um, to confirm in young people, you can still get period pain even if you have treated all the endometriosis. And there are so many reasons why surgery may not help with the pain. Endometriosis may be the initial cause of the pain, but like what we've heard tonight, Pain is so complex, it can evolve into nerve pain, bladder pain, bowel pain, muscle pain. And so endometriosis no longer is the main component of your pain. And so treating that alone is not going to be enough to help. And that's when you need multidisciplinary care, like um, seeing a pain specialist.
and pelvic floor physiotherapists. Endometriosis may contribute to the pain that you've already got. It can trigger other pain, you know, trigger muscle spasm, mus muscle pain, or nerve pain. Or endometriosis may be completely irrelevant. And like we have heard so much tonight about post-surgical pain, if you have nerve sensitization, having surgery can cause more pain and more opioid use. There is actually not convincing evidence to say that surgery for endometriosis help with the pain. There's been Cochrane review, systemic, um, systematic reviews, and we don't have conclusive data. And there are a number of reasons why that is. So one is with the diagnosis. You can't really say, I want to treat this group of women with endometriosis and randomize them to no surgery versus surgery because to know who has endometriosis requires surgery. And it also not ethical to put someone through surgery and have a laparoscopy and say, I'm going to randomize you to no treatment when you are there and they are having the risk of surgery. And also of all the issues I've said just now about endometriosis may not be the cause of pain and pain can be very complex and there could be other things that cause more pains sooner than later. So I think we are unlikely to be getting any good evidence about surgery anytime soon. And the important thing for the individual is whether surgery helps with your pain. And it needs to be tailored to each person and to the type of pain and type of disease, whether it's superficial disease or deep disease. So in terms of superficial endometriosis, the surgery itself is actually not too complicated. Most gynecologists can perform it. But the danger of doing laparoscopies for superficial disease, because it is easy to do, it is still has carries its own surgical risks, but not as much as severe disease. And if you keep doing repeat surgeries, you are going to get more sensitization of your nerves. You can actually get more pain. And I would avoid doing surgeries too close together, you know, at least two years apart. And only if you think that the surgery does actually help with your pain. Like if you've had a surgery, you get good pain relief for one or two years and the pain slowly come back and it feels like endometriosis pain again, then it's reasonable to do another surgery if you can't control the pain by any other means like conservative hormonal if you get pain relief after surgery only for three to six months, then really surgery is not worth it. And you need to work harder on other things like hormonal treatment, other aspects of pain, multidisciplinary pain. And having surgery every six to 12 months is simply ridiculous, okay? Um, and uh, just wanna make a comment about hormonal treatment, even though we're not talking hormones today, Optimal hormonal treatment to me, it doesn't matter what hormone, it doesn't matter which pill you're on, whether you're on the contraceptive pill, oral progestogen pill, Implanon, Mirena, Depo, as long as the hormone that you tolerate that can stop periods and ovulation, then that will be optimal hormonal treatment for endometriosis. But it can only be used in people who don't desire fertility at the time because all hormones have contraceptive effect. Moving on to deep endometriosis, which is very different. This is more the severe form of endometriosis. And so surgery is more complicated. And I would advise to have the surgery done by specialist endometriosis surgeon. And perhaps doing surgery early may prevent progression of Having said that, I'm not suggesting that all endometriosis will progress, but if it is the deep form of endometriosis, the risk of the progression is that it can invade into nearby organs like bladder and bowel and ureters. And the first surgery needs to be the best surgery. 
to completely remove or destroy any endometriosis that you can see. And combining it with good hormonal treatment after surgery will give you optimal pain relief and minimize recurrence. And we really want to just do one surgery. And hopefully that's the best surgery. And then we can manage your pain with other non-surgical means after that. Because each surgery gets more difficult. When deep endometriosis recur, we're not just dealing with endometriosis, we're dealing with scar tissue as well. So there's higher risk of bowel or ureter injuries, higher risk of nerve damage, nerve sensitization. And one comment about endometriomas, um, endometriomas cysts in the ovaries. Whenever we operate on the ovary, it can reduce some of the ovarian research. It's inevitable that some of the ovary will get damaged during the surgery. And that's another reason why you would want to do some to do the surgery with someone who specialized in this, who use minimal diathermy on the, on the ovaries to minimize the pain. What about bowel surgery? Sorry about the overhead call. Um, so when endometriosis involves bowel, do we need to do bowel surgery? And when bowel surgery, I mean bowel resection, um, which is major surgery. There's only really one absolute indication for bowel surgery for endometriosis is if, it is if there is bowel obstruction. When the endometriosis is invaded through the bowel wall so big that it's actually blocking, that is the only absolute indication. Other indication is significant pain. So significant pain on defecation, especially in bowel period time or cyclic bleeding. But even then, pain on defecation often can still be helped with um, treating the endometriosis, restoring anatomy without the need for bowel surgery. And yes, you may leave a little bit of endometriosis in the bowel wall, but a lot of those women can still get good symptom relief even without the bowel surgery. So when do you involve a colorectal surgeon for that surgery? If you're planning bowel surgery, obviously. Um, if you're having repeat surgery, so if the endometriosis recur and you're having second surgery, like I said, there's much higher risk of bowel injury in that case because you're dealing with endometriosis and scar tissue. But it would be wise to involve your co a colorectal surgeon. If the gynecologist is not comfortable dividing bowel adhesions, then of course it's safer to involve the colorectal surgeon. Having said that, a good endometriosis specialist can divide bowel adhesions and shave the bowel, um, the endometriosis down to the bowel wall without the need to involve a colorectal surgeon. And clearing most of the endometriosis can give good symptom relief, even if you leave a little bit of endometriosis, residual endometriosis in the bowel wall itself. Now, in the previous slide, I've just said the first surgery needs to be the best surgery and to clear all the endometriosis. But in this case, with bowel wall endometriosis, you need to balance out between removing all endo versus the risks of bowel surgery. And because bowel surgery is a much more major surgery with its own inherent risks, um, on balance, removing most endometriosis and followed up with good hormonal treatment can um, be a very good option. And that's usually my approach if they don't have really bad bowel symptoms. And then if the pain recurs or if they still have significant bowel problems, then the second surgery may involve colorectal surgery with bowel resection. Now, no matter what we do, even after a bowel resection, endometriosis can still recur. And if it recurs and causes pain, after a bowel resection, then that surgery is really extremely difficult and high risk and you really want to avoid. I'm not gonna spend much time on fertility, but it is a special group because we can't use hormonal treatment. So if they are actively trying for baby or they don't want to use contraceptives or any hormone treatment that can prevent pregnancy, then there are only two options if they do have endometriosis without a pain is to fall pregnant or do surgery. So out of the two, obviously falling pregnant is the preferred option. So 
consider IVF early if they're not pregnant. And I usually say if you try for six or 12 months, and that goes comes down to three months if they are already in the late 30s or if they've got severe disease. I remember age is a big factor. In um, I don't think we'll do the poll, but hysterectomy is can be a good option for period pain and, um, and even for endometriosis, but that is not taken lightly because it is a larger operation and it is irreversible. Uh, one of the misconceptions is a lot of people think hysterectomy is giving up eggs, but that is not true. Hysterectomy means remove uterus or womb. So the word hysterectomy just means removing the womb. It says nothing about the cervix, tubes, or ovaries. And in the medical term, when we do a hysterectomy, we um, tend to do total hysterectomy, meaning removing uterus and cervix with bilateral self-injectomies, meaning removing both fallopian tubes, and we preserve and keep ovaries. So no uterus means no period and no period pain, but it does not necessarily mean no pelvic pain. And that's why some, a lot of women after hysterectomy can still have pain. They will still ovulate if they're not on hormone suppression and they can still but it can be a good option um, as a latest Swedish study, 137 participants who had a hysterectomy between age 18 to 45, 76% had reduction in their pain in those who have severe pain and 84% are satisfied with the surgical outcome. And the most important thing to take away from that study is that they had similar findings in those who had ovaries removed versus retaining ovaries. And uh, yes, it's a big surgery, it's irreversible. The regret mostly is relating to pregnancy desire and loss of family. We did a, um, cross-sectional study at the women's is unpublished. Uh, we are writing it up at the moment. And uh, we sent out questionnaires to all the women who had a hysterectomy and found the overall regret rate is about 8%. Um, and of those who regret, most of them are relation, in relation to pregnancy desire or loss. So they may not, the hysterectomy may not take away the pain, um, but many still do not regret it. Um, and there's no real long-term health consequence if we are retaining ovaries. And you also have added benefits, um, no periods. That's the only time someone can, you know, I can guarantee someone that they don't get a period. But remember, no period doesn't mean no pain, no pelvic pain. Significantly reduce the risk of endometriosis coming back. There's no chance of uterine cancer because we've removed the uterus, no chance of cervical cancer if we're removing cervix as well, and uh, lowered chance of ovarian cancer if we're removing the uterus. So as the last result, we're going further and further extreme now in the surgical options. Um, the last resort is to remove both ovaries. That is actually very effective in treating endometriosis related pain because after menopause, endometriosis, even if you have them, goes inactive and quiet. But it gives you surgical menopause, which is associated with increased risk of osteoporosis, heart disease, and shortened lifespan. And you'll need hormone uh, replacement until age 53 to minimize those risks. So it's, it's rarely done now. That really is our last. And if you want to, and because it's so irreversible and has health consequence, you have to really think twice about removing both ovaries. Sometimes we remove one ovary if it is one-sided pain and you only need one ovary to prevent menopause. Sometimes we use a hormone called Cineral nasal spray or Zolodex injections, which are hormones that can render you medically menopausal to shut the system down to sort of give you a taste of what menopause is like and see whether that actually improves your pain. And we use that quite a bit um, to try and differentiate what type of pain you've got. If you've, your pain improves on those um, hormones, 
I call, let's call it menopause hormone, then there's a good chance that your pain can be um, logically related, cycle related. And then just, if when you're on those hormones and your pain is no different, then you really need to look harder at other aspects. So we've still got lots of challenges in terms of pelvic pain and endometriosis. And um, thanks to the National, Act National Action Plan for Endometriosis and the Endometriosis Research Fund, um, we got a you know, reasonable chunk of that and have nine projects running at the Royal Women's Hospital, University of Melbourne and Mercy Hospital for Women jointly running these projects. And if you want to know more about it, you can go to endometriosis.org. Thank you. sharing. Thanks very much, Claudia. That was fantastic. Um, all right. Well, that concludes all the uh, presentations tonight, but we absolutely want to get, get to some of the questions. Um, I thank you to Susan for answering some of the Q&As that have been coming through. Um, I have a question for you, uh, Claudia. There was a question about screening for endometriosis. Is, some, is that something that people can do? Um, is that a thing? We don't have a screening questionnaire. Um, and uh, there are no, well, one of the projects is to establish a questionnaire to see exclude endometriosis or in women less likely to have endometriosis to prevent them from having surgery. Um, but it is very hard. Um, we have, in terms of diagnostic testing is the specialist ultrasound and you can see the nodules to look for deep endometriosis, but there really is nothing to diagnose superficial um, we tend to think if you've got cyclical pain, so it doesn't matter what part of the cycle, it can be pre period pain or premenstrual pain or mid cycle pain. If there's a cyclical component to your pain, then that does point us more towards endometriosis. If it's more chronic daily pain, then you think more nerve muscles, gut, bladder. Got it. Um, Rajiv, here is a question for you. Is there a link between pudendal neuralgia and sacroiliac joint issues? Uh, thanks, Nick, and thank you. I do not know who asked this question. Now, any pain in the pelvis or around that region can cause muscle spasms, can uh, allow less mobility to your pelvis, can uh, cause uh, issues around the ligaments, and your movement can be restricted. So yes, uh, it's, it, it's like a chicken and egg story that yes, if you develop pain in one area, it can very easily give you secondary pains into the muscles and joints. Short answer is yes, but long answer is due to the less mobility of the muscles. Yes, this can be treated and we can treat both pudendal and sacroiliac joint dysfunction. All right. Um, a question, I have widespread chronic pain. I'd like to have a baby, but I'm terrified of pelvic pain or abdominal pain post cesarean section. Is there any evidence about whether a natural labor or C-section would be better long-term for somebody like me? Well, from my perspective, we get a lot of people asking about, should I have a baby? And these are just people that we look after with chronic pain. And my standard answer is, I wouldn't want you to regret something. So if you, if you want to start a family, then then do your best to start a family. Uh, pregnancy is a, is a generally an analgesic state. Uh, a lot of patients' chronic pains, with, wherever they might be, generally settle down, although pregnancy itself, of course, can cause mechanical pelvic pains that occur with pregnancy. So um, we always say to uh, patients or ladies, um, uh, if it's something that is very important to you, um, then it's something that you should focus on and we'll kind of deal with things as we go. Um, uh, Susan, do you have any comments on that at all? Um, what would you say to somebody asking you those questions? I think it depends on, you know, what their condition is. So if it's something that, for want of a better word, has a bit of an immune flavour, 
something yeah. like you know fibromyalgia or they've got some other immune things they tend to find pregnancy is generally a good time but then after they have the baby they can have you know go back to some of their own symptoms and things uh it's really hard to tell um as far as which sort of delivery goes I, i'm not the best person to ask about that but um uh it's a hard one, but I would encourage them not to be scared good. and to do their best to have a good team around them to manage the situations they come across. Um, uh, Claudia might have more thoughts on this as well. It's, it's a hard one to predict, isn't it, Claudia? Yes, yes. And it's one that frustrates me, actually, um, in terms of dealing with endometriosis and uh, women in reproductive age. Because like I say, age is a big factor in fertility. So many women say, um, I want to fix my pain before I fall pregnant. But if it is endometriosis related pain, pregnancy itself is part of the treatment. And once you finish with families, we have more options to help with your pain. Of course, it is very different when you've got nerve pain, muscle pain, then that is you know, a different you know, um, category. But even then, it is your priority. If your priority is to have a family, then, uh, then you need to put that into perspective and remembering age is very important. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, how about pelvic pain treatment during pregnancy? There are modalities which are safe during pregnancy. So we do treat some, some ladies with pregnancy, but again, we work very closely with the obstetrician. Um, a lot of our patients that get pregnant um, choose to wean down and stop a lot of their pain medication because it's a balance between what would do good and effects of the, of the growing fetus. Um, but there are some safe things. And generally in pregnancy, we revert back to what we call category one or category A medications deemed safe in pregnancy. And we revert back to a lot of simple therapies. And again, we should all be using simple therapies anyway. Panadol, uh, sometimes local anesthetic can help. And actually, sometimes a very simple opioid like codeine can be helpful in pregnancy, apart from all the other nerve pain medications that we use. But again, it's a one on, you know, it's a, it's a case by case basis. What is the pain? If it's a muscle pain, then we treat muscle pain with simple therapies. If it's a severe neuropathic pain, then we're in a, you know, a different ball game in terms of managing things. So uh, again, we can, we, can, we, can, we can assess and treat as it happens. Um, I had mild coccyx pain during stage three of pregnancy. This is common as baby's head can move the coccyx during delivery. Can this be further investigated and treated, Rajiv? Uh, most of the coccyx pain which would have happened during the pregnancy is due to the uh, hormones which come out and relax the coccyx, the baby can come out. And once those hormones relaxing is gone, it should go back to the normal position. However, we do see a lot of patients in whom laxity is left over. And yes, we can treat this with uh, simple measures and we can uh, treat this with medication and injections, uh, pain interventions as well. Uh, depending upon what the situation is, this can be discussed in, in a pain specialist clinic. So uh, I, I cannot give you more details, but, but this would perhaps need further examination and discussion of treatments in, in the clinic. Good, thanks Rajiv. Uh, here's one from a gentleman. I have persistent pelvic pain since a robotic prostatectomy, which has now moved to the coccyx and it's difficult to sit down. My specialists say there's no recurrent cancer um, that is causing the symptoms. Um, you put up with this for three years, any suggestions? Yes. Um, see a pain clinic, see a pain specialist. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that certainly we treat, assess and treat. Uh, there may be a, a neuropathic pain related to the surgery. It must, might be a muscle pain. There are many options, but I think the key is to get somebody that knows how to assess the situation to do just that, assess the situation. Um, Question for Susan, would practitioners getting behind a petition to the Victorian state government be beneficial for um, PEP advocacy? 
Yes, I've, I've replied to that lovely oh, good. Thank you. physiotherapist. And we'd be delighted if they wanted to organise it. And Kirsty Mead, our executive director, I'm sure would be delighted to hear about them who would like to assist us in Victoria. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, let's just flick down. If anyone sees a question, please feel free to um, uh, mention it. Um, so I've had pain for years, was turned away. Turns out when I had a hysterectomy, my surgeon informed me I had endometriosis. My uterus was fused to my bowel. My pain persists. Would, I, would you suggest I ask for a referral? I think you should be assessed by a pain specialist, absolutely. So you've had appropriate uh, gynecological treatment. You are left with a pain that is moderate to severe, that is affecting your life in some way, that is presumably not responsive to simple therapies. You should seek a specialist's um, uh, assessment. Um, you answered some questions on cysts, Susan, so thank you for that. Um, there was a question on uh, vulvodynia. Has anyone uh, answered that question? Um, somebody has a daughter with um, vulvodynia. Uh, she's also having some pelvic muscle pain. Um, uh, I suggested the pelvic pain clinic at the Children's Hospital. Um, Rajiv, do you have any comments on, on uh, vulvodynia? Uh, uh, yeah, my experience uh, suggests there are many causes of vulvodynia. It does not have to be uh, coming from the reproductive organs, i.e. uterus, ovaries, or uh, the tubes. It can be because of dysfunction of any organ. The uh, nervous system is quite integrated for the lower end of bladder, the bowel, and if there is an issue with an, uh, bowel function or bladder function, this can further get uh, as a referred pain to the vulval region. So I would say this uh, child needs to be looked into in a joint clinic, as Nick said, perhaps in, in the children's hospital, and not to be just pointed towards endometriosis, which I think the, the child has not started her menstrual periods even. So let's not classify, as Susan had said, as endometriosis, and let's investigate the child would be our initial thought. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, I have um, severe deep endometriosis, adenomyosis with severe chronic sacroiliac joint pain and, and sciatic pain down my leg. Just a reminder that people with um, chronic pain can develop other conditions. You know, people with chronic pain get appendicitis. People with chronic pain can get sacroiliac joint pain. So just because you've got pain in the same area doesn't mean that that is directly associated to the, to the, to the pain. But for me, it's the same thing. If you've got pain that is not responsive to simple therapies, you've seen your GP, you might have seen a specialist, um, then, then, then seek you know, step two might be to seek somebody that is expert in pain, pain management, pain assessment to point you in the right direction. Um, I think, I think we may have covered most of the big burning questions if unless any of the other panelists have seen any other questions that needed addressing. Just mindful of time too. Um, um, if no one else has got any questions, we might sift through those questions at a, at a point in the near future and, um, uh, and answer the questions and then refer the answers to uh, all the attendees. Um, I'd like to ask just for final thoughts from all, um, from all attendees. Susan, if you've got any some final, final comments, uh, please. Well, thank you very much. Been a fantastic evening. I, I actually, one of the biggest causes of missed pain in the pelvis that I see is spasm and pain in obturator internus. So just to tell people that if you've got someone who talks about a stabbing pain on the side that makes them want to bend forward, makes it a bit hard to walk, maybe goes through to their back, down the front of their leg, those sorts of things, feels like an achy, stabby pain, think obturator internus. And that one is so often missed. These are the people that will have pain when the vaginal ultrasound probe pushes out the side. And with one finger, you can diagnose it, one finger in the vagina to push out on the side and you'll find it. To me, that is the biggest undiagnosed cause of pelvic pain. Excellent. Thanks for that insight.
Uh, Claudia, do you have any final comments or, uh, or, or questions or things that you wanted to uh, let everyone know about? Um, well, in relation to my talk about surgery, if you anything, anything. have um, <laughs> endometriosis diagnosed, find a surgeon that actually specialises in endometriosis surgery. Good. So not all gynaecologists are endometriosis specialists. No, no. Just like not all ultrasounds have the same quality, you've got radiographers versus ultrasonologists. Not all gynecologists specialize, and only a proportion of specialists. Thanks very much, Claudia. Uh, Rajiv, any final uh, comments? Uh, very quick, Nick. Thank you very much to the uh, attendees and thank you to the panelists. You've made this evening really interesting for me. One final thought I want to share with you is do not sit and think that you are alone in this problem. There is help available. People understand this pain. I know uh, pelvic pain is very private uh, in terms of it's in the private parts, but uh, you can uh, seek help and help is available. So please keep that in mind. Thank you very much all. Great. And um, a final thank you to Ramsey for putting this together. Um, but a special thanks to all the panelists for taking at least two hours uh, out of your evening uh, from friends and family to, to, to give to this. So thanks very much, everyone, and um, uh, hopefully see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay.